Hello, everyone, and I am so delighted to have a great group of UNE faculty, staff, friends, neighbors, alumni, and Facebook Live audience coming and joining us for our very first uh, Lunch and Learn um, in celebration of UNE's commitment to the Beach to Beacon. Um, we have um, been connected with the Beach to Beacon for many years, mostly through our students as volunteers in the medical tent. More recently, uh, UNE has become a uh, sponsor of the Beach to Beacon, and um, as a university committed to both healthcare education, uh, the wellness of our employees, and with a president who likes to run, uh, we decided we really wanted to build uh, UNE's connection to this legendary main race. Um, so we've decided to provide some workshops and training opportunities uh, led by our very own experts, our faculty and staff. So you will see when you come in, um, there's a postcard with uh, listing all the upcoming events. We have a bunch of training run, weekly training runs on the Biddeford and Portland campuses. Uh, some other upcoming workshops. You can find all the upcoming events and to register for some UNE swag on une.edu uh, slash UNE B2B. And for those of you who are not sitting in this room but are running and training, please take pictures of yourself, send us selfies, let us know where you're running, and we can track our whole UNE community as they participate in this, in this wellness uh, opportunity. So today we have, we are very lucky to have Anne Marie Davy, our very own Anne Marie Davy, who's going to talk a little bit about nutrition. Uh, Anne Marie is an assistant clinical professor um, and is a registered dietitian with over 25 years of experience in the fields of nutrition and health promotion. She has worked in a wide variety of settings, including education, corporate, for profit, retail, not for profit, and healthcare, and has also pu published her research in several publications. But she is not just smart, she is also a competitive athlete, having completed 20 26 mile marathons, 15 triathlons, including qualifying for and competing in the first women's Olympic marathon trials in 1984. So you should listen to her, and I'll turn it over to her now. Oh, and Facebook, if you have questions, comments, want to say hi, please put it in the comments because we have Sarah Whistler who is going to make sure that you're heard. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And I'm going to just put it out there right now that when I ran the Olympic trials with Joni, I was much behind her. And today, I'm ahead of her, so I'm really excited. <laughs> um, but I've run the Beach to Beacon eight times, so this will be my ninth time. How many people here are running Beach to Beacon? Awesome. OK, great. So we've got some special tips for you to get your body fueled for peak performance and I wouldn't normally share this with you because you're my competitors right now um, but I will do my best because you're the UNE family so I'm gonna keep it really informal if you have questions stop me if you want to talk about something else, that's fine. I'm going to share my tips as a competitive, highly competitive athlete, and also evidence-based guidelines as a clinical professor. So there's a lot of stuff out there about nutrition. You all eat. You can all be nutritionists if you want. Um, so we really have to go back to what's the latest science. So that's what I'm going to share with you today. But stop me as we go along. So I'm going to first put nutrition in perspective. I have a bias. I'd like to say that that's the most important thing about your training, but it's not. Um, so we'll talk about key training components sports nutrition best practices, some resources for you. I've got some handouts. And then stop me if you have any questions. So key elements for top performance. Training. If I hadn't been doing any training and I got up to the starting line, 26 miles is a really long way. Maybe I want to drive it instead. Um, so you've got to do your homework. You've got to get out there and do the training. And I'm delighted that UNE is doing some training runs and you've got some experts to help you out. You've all got to be motivated. 
So it's really important. We're really excited to be part of the UNE Beach to Beacon team. And we're all going to do our best and do great as a team. Nutrition is also important along with your training. Because if you're doing all this training and then you're putting junk in your body, it's like going backwards, going the other way. So you've got to have them both working hand in hand. One day of rest a week is really important, and getting that eight hours of rest each night is also critical for healing. How many of you get eight hours a night? Work on that. Okay, let's, oh, more. Awesome. Probably still growing. Yeah. So, um, and then psych. <laughs> As I mentioned, it's really important to be psyched. So every time you get up to the starting line, believe that this is going to be your best race ever. Don't get sort of taken aback by somebody else's has bigger muscles or a nicer uniform or they look faster. Just go with you're the best that you can be. So one of the things I want you to take away from today is your body is a magnificent machine. So you've got to train hard, feed it right, fuel it right, and it will perform at its best. So bless you. With training, rest, and diet, the body will perform at its best. So here are some best practices, and I have them on a handout, which I'll, which I'll share um, at the end. So number one, hydrate. Number two, fuel the body for peak performance. And I'm going to talk about how to do that. Timing is everything. And this is probably the one thing that has changed most recently with science, is we realize that that magnificent machine needs to be fueled evenly through the day. So I run to eat. And I eat six or eight times a day. And that keeps my body fueled the best. And people that know me say, you're eating all the time. And yes, that's right. So one of the things that we worry about most with athletes is making sure that they're evenly fueled through the day. You need to race to replace. So when you're done training or done racing, you want to eat within 30 minutes, and we'll talk more about what you choose. And then we'll do our schedule for race day so that you're ready to go. So number one is hydrate. The body is 60 to 70% water. Adequate hydration is essential for performance. Hydrate before, during, and after. How many people have water bottles here? Hopefully, if you took a bag lunch, and I was delighted that there was water and not soda or sugar-sweetened beverages here. Um, and that dehydration is the one thing that most often impairs performance. So I often counsel athletes who have cramps or are struggling with injuries. And one of the first things we look at is their hydration level. Hydration will lead to fatigue and can be fatal. So water's taking all the energy into your cells. It's taking all the waste products out. So really important to stay hydrated. Anybody know the best litmus test to know how you're hydrated? How do you tell that you're well hydrated? Pinch your skin. Pinch your skin. And what does it look like? How long it takes to fall down. So if you're hydrated, does it go right back? Uh, quicker. quicker. Hmm. Anybody else? Another way to tell whether you're properly hydrated. Oh. You're in color. Exactly. So you're pee. So by the end of the day, it should be clear. And that is the far the best way to tell whether you're properly hydrated or not. So clear to very pale at the end of the day. If not, um, it's really important. So one of my key things for Beach to Beacon is I do not skip a water stop. Don't wait till you're thirsty. I'll take one swallow. I may not drink the whole cup, but I want to stay hydrated. That race is often humid. It may be hot. 
Other times I've run it eight times. Sometimes it's cloudy and that's better, but many times than not, it's been hot. So don't skip a water stop. Sports drinks will have a slight benefit if you're running longer than an hour. The only benefit that I have for sports drinks is generally people will drink more of a sports drink. They'll stay better hydrated if it has a flavor. Would you agree? Some people get tired of drinking water all the time. Um, and then alcoholic beverages, energy drinks, those can be harmful. You've got a lot of added sugar, and then you've got caffeine, which that can be a problem. So any coffee drinkers here? Ah, a few. And how much coffee are you drinking? Anybody? So when I went to the Olympic trials, caffeine was a banned substance by the Olympic Committee. So in our drug tests, caffeine was one of the substances. It's a powerful stimulant. And so that always sort of made a mark for me, like, wow, it's a drug. So any more than four eight-ounce cups, so a total of 32 ounces, is considered on drugs. So just four eight-ounce. So I see students coming in with 20-ounce um, and a couple of those, then you're off into uh, drug land. So it can impair your ability to sleep. It can give you the jitters. And you certainly don't want to be in the restroom when the race starts. Um, so I'm always very cautious of caffeine. So for hydration, plan on consuming about half your body weight in ounces as your goal for the day. And that's from the American College of Sports Medicine. We used to say six to eight cups per day, but it really depends on your body size. So it really depends on your overall weight. Remember, your body's 60 to 70 percent water. Question? Is that for, is that for recreationally trained athletes, or is that High performing. Mm -hmm. like, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. I don't. I, I, mm. So remember, your body is almost seventy percent water. So that's why. So it's a good goal. Try it and see what happens. Everyone's different. Now, some of you may be heavy sweaters. You may just glow when you run. You may not lose a whole lot of water. So yeah. So, but that's what the American College of Sports Medicine general recommendation is. Yes, question. Would that include something that had, would, would that include something that had embedded water, like melons? Mm -hmm. That would be in the total. It can be, but that's a little bit harder to detect. But I would count dairy, um, milk beverages, or any of the dairy alternatives, juices, flavored waters. Things, as long as they don't have caffeine. Um. Oh, uh. <laughs> All right. There's one in every crowd. We're going to move on from that. So thirst is actually a late sign of dehydration. So you've already lost 2% of your body weight when your thirst kicks in. So that body that's the magnificent machine, this is one of the mechanisms that isn't right on target. So you've really got to make sure that you're hydrated, which is why I never skip a water stop. Um, I always take something. So there's a wide variety of sports drinks, flavored drinks, energy drinks. Um, Gatorade was probably the first that came on the market. These will provide a benefit for people that are doing much longer runs. So if you're doing half marathons, marathons, triathlons, training for longer than an hour, then there may be a benefit in that it helps maintain your blood sugar. It can minimize the effect of gastric emptying. And it just m may keep you better hydrated because you drink more. So fueling the body. Complex carbohydrates are the high test fuel. So this is another one where I'd have you figure your body weight in kilograms. Anybody know how to do that? 
What's your body weight in kilograms? How do you get that? Heather. 2.2. Right. So take your body weight in pounds, divide it by 2.2. And this is how we calculate how many grams of carbohydrate you needed today to maintain that high test fuel. As you increase your training, you also increase the amount of carbohydrate. And for our endurance marathoners, we would go up to 12 grams per kilogram per day. So let's just say what I'd like to do is if I'm 50 kilograms, I'd multiply that by five. That gives me 250 grams of carbohydrate per day. So most athletes should be somewhere between 250 and 350 per day to maintain your adequate energy level for training. So carbs provide four calories per gram. They're the primary fuel for brain, the nervous system, and your red blood cells, which get the oxygen going to all your muscles. They also will are prime for putting glycogen in your muscles. Everybody heard the term glycogen? So glycogen and the amount of glycogen that you have determines how far and how fast you go. So the minimum requirement just for daily life is 130 grams per day. So your liver stores about 400 calories. Your muscles can store 1,400 calories or more. Trained athletes will store more. So this is another benefit to your training. And many people will actually carbo load, and we'll talk about that getting ready for race day, um, so that that glycogen has as much as it can to get you as far and fast as you'd like. So complex carbs are whole grains, vegetables, fruits, and low-fat milk and dairy products. We get carbs from all five food groups. Now, why do carbs have a bad rap? A lot of people I talk to are like, oh, I'm on this ketogenic diet or on this high-protein, low-carb diet, and it's really working for me. What's, what's giving carbs the bad rap? Anybody? Yeah, the simple sugars. So it's the, des we're not talking desserts, ice cream, soda, um, candy bars. M&M's, Skittles, um, we're talking whole grains, vegetables, fruits, dairy, and plant-based proteins to get all of your carbs. Um, so the Olympic Committee's dietitians, whom I have worked with, um, have come up with this wonderful training plate. Um, and I've got copies of those here. And you can just Google my plate for athletes, and it will come right up. But it shows that we're really making sure that you're getting adequate whole grains and those veggies, and not so much emphasis on um, the protein. So I always go to my plate. Somebody want to come up and hold this for me? Thank you. So I go to my plate, and here's your um, protein right here. That's what the size of a burger should be or the size of a deck of cards. So when you go out to eat, does your steak look like this? Okay. So we tend to eat more protein than we actually need. Another way to look at it is your protein should be the size of a hockey puck. What's more important is that your vegetables, and your fruits should take up most of your plate. So half your plate. And with the, my plate for athletes, they're adding um, breads, rice, grains, pasta, cereal, sort of your key pre-race meal. So thank you so much. Um, so just remember, protein, that's how much you need. Um, the size of a hockey puck or a deck of cards.
Fats are also important. We only need one tablespoon per day, and we recommend using olive oil, canola oil, healthy vegetable oils. Also, you get some fats from nuts and seeds. That's great for lubricating your joints, keeping your skin healthy, overall fat-soluble vitamins, really important. And then protein, the recommendations are now 1.2 to 2 grams per kilogram. We're looking at sort of getting protein in right after your runs to repair muscle tissue, your dosage during the day for your six feedings a day is 20 to 27 grams. But remember, if you eat extra protein, so if your steak is four decks of cards, well, that's not stored as protein. It's going to be stored as fat. So, and I get a lot of athletes here at UNE asking me about the protein shakes and the protein powders. Um, and in one end and out the other, probably not a real benefit um, as your training. So with proteins, choose lean meats, poultry, seafood, low-fat dairy. We're also encouraging athletes to use more plant-based proteins because they're getting what else with your plant-based proteins? What else are you getting? You're getting your complex carbs. So it's like a double win with the plant-based proteins. So fueling your body for peak performance, look at your carbohydrate intake first. Anybody had a day where they felt like there was a 10-pound weight on each leg? Like, oh, I just don't have it in me today. I've had those days. I can usually look back and say either I'm training too hard or I'm not replacing my glycogen, so I'm not eating enough carbs. Um, and then I also will look at fat and protein. So here's what I recommend. Is anybody using my fitness pal or chronometer? Anybody? Yes, in the back, my fitness pal? Awesome. Once a week, I put in my daily intake and just make sure that my carbs are where they should be, somewhere higher than 250 grams a day. So if you're not tracking your intake, go to one of these free sites, put in your day's intake, see how much carb do you have, how much protein and how much fat, and then adjust accordingly. Yes, question. And any questions, send them along on Facebook and we'll check in. Um, one of the new fads call it in dieting is um, intermittent fasting mm -hmm. where the amount that you take in is not necessarily different it's just the timing that you take it what's your view on how that affects training for something like beach to beacon or just overall fitness compared to just regular dieting throughout the day yeah my first um question would be what is the goal or the intent for the intermittent fasting is it weight loss is it cleansing what are you what are your thoughts like why would someone be doing that? Well, I, mean, I, I obviously don't do it, but... Um, <laughs> Good I, answer. Good answer. I like that answer. I, I've seen it done, and um, part of it is weight loss, um, but I'm, uh, some people have used it as a way to just control the volume that they eat mm -hmm. as opposed to larger scales throughout the day, so I'm just curious how it affects that actual energy piece outside of that time when you're eating or the time when you're fasting. Yeah, so... Um, I would say for someone who is not training for an event, maybe an athlete in off season that is trying to lose weight, that might work for them. But I wouldn't recommend it during a training time or during a competitive season. Um, and then I would be cautious about how often I'm doing it. Again, because without the carbohydrates and the glycogen, the body's not going to run well. So it will impair performance. So that would be my caution. And with a medical provider, some guidance, of course, as well. Um, because there can be harmful effects. So good question. All right. So timing's everything. Eat, eat, eat. But it's not Thanksgiving every meal. It's small, frequent feedings, pregame, most athletes are eating their pregame meal four hours prior. 
two hours prior for morning games. And many people will have a snack half an hour before the start. I would try it on training runs. How many of you eat right before you run? Anybody? Like within 30 minutes. An hour? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So figure out what works best for you. What's that timing, particularly for race day, where you feel comfortable? Do you want something in your stomach? Do you want to maintain your blood sugar? Or do you want to just not have anything at all? Everybody's different. So we're looking at breakfast should be whole grains, a protein of some sort. My favorite is peanut butter. Um, peanut butter banana on a bagel or even peanut butter and oatmeal um, and some yogurt. Lunch, more whole grain breads lean meats or plant-based protein, lots of veggies, fruit, and this wasn't bad, except for the sun chips, this bag lunch here. Yes, question. I just wanted to know if you could explain a little bit more about the benefits of peanut butter, because I'm a true fan of eating peanut butter before any long run as well. I, It's something I've tried and tested and works, but I've heard various reasons why about how you burn it down slowly as you're running and so on and so forth, but could you address that? Absolutely. Um, so in my book, peanut butter is a perfect food. Um, it's got a right combination of some protein and some fat for that longer, stays with me longer. And it's recommended as one of the post-race sort of replacements, the ideal sort of formulation. So peanut butter on a bagel or peanut butter and crackers or peanut butter just on a banana um, works really well. It's got the right protein to carb ratio as a post-race replacement. Yeah. And it sticks with you. Um, so snacks, here we go. Fruits and nuts, notice you've got a combination of protein and carbohydrate, crackers and cheese, there's my fave, bagel and peanut butter, yogurt and nuts, carrots and hummus, a lot of students are really enjoying that as a, a post-training run snack and granola bar and nuts. Any of these look good to you? Anybody? You guys must be full. Nothing sounds good right now. So, all right, so dinner, whole grain breads, more of the same. Are you seeing a pattern here? More of the same, whole grain breads, lean meats, plant-based proteins, vegetables, fruit, and low-fat dairy. So, race to replace. After you're done running, how many people feel like eating? I know I don't, usually. But within 30 minutes, it's important to have some sort of refuel snack that gets that protein right back to repairing muscle tissue and also replacing the glycogen. So you're ready for the next day or your next training session. Many athletes, particularly preseason, are doing double sessions. So really important to have that post-training um, um, snack and then refuel meal within two hours. We've got to replace the glycogen, repair the muscle tissue, and the ideal ratio is three to one. So some common um, uh, sort of examples of pre-race snacks or replacements, chocolate low-fat milk. Anybody like chocolate low-fat milk? So um, we had a UNE nutrition symposium um, in April, and we had one of the Olympic dietitians come from um, South Korea, and she had coached the women's hockey team to win the gold this year. And she said, much to her chagrin, when they got to South Korea, they don't sell chocolate low-fat milk. So she had to set up a chocolate low-fat milk factory. <laughs> In a, aside the refueling center with um, tubes and spigots and cocoa powder and dairy beverage products that were available in Korea, South Korea. So who would have thought? 
but she said the women's hockey team just thrives on chocolate low-fat milk. Um, so that was really interesting to see how she had set that up. Fruit smoothies, peanut butter and bagels, and cheese and crackers. So here we are. You guys have been eating complex carbs all summer, checking your grams of carbohydrate daily. Now it's race time. So the race starts at 8, so I'd highly recommend some sort of light breakfast at 5.30. Maybe I'd have half a bagel, a yogurt, cereal, granola. Anybody, any pre-raced favorites that you have? Yogurt and peanut butter, excellent. See, that's gonna carry you through. You got your protein for longevity. Anybody else, pre-race favorites? Bagel and peanut butter, that's my go-to, is a bagel and peanut butter or granola and yogurt, something light. Um, nothing gassy, I wouldn't have chili. I wouldn't have beans unless you wanna eliminate your competitor some other way, but you don't want anything that's gonna be upsetting your stomach. So light, something that you're used to, stick with your own routine. You might, I see a lot of runners at the Beach to Beacon start having a granola bar or some sort of pre-race snack because you're getting in there, you're parking. <laughs> There's a lot of logistics before the race. Those of you that have done it before know. Um, so, it could be a while, so a pre-race snack is often good. Try it in training, don't try it on race day. And then there's a ton of post-race snacks. They do a wonderful job at Beach to Beacon. And you wanna have your post-race meal by 11. So don't try anything new on race day. Hydrate, don't skip a water stop. Choose foods high in carb, low in fat low in fiber, no gas, and no concentrated sugars or sweets. So I do not recommend M&Ms or Skittles or some of the other sort of quick energy. I would rather see people eating bananas and fruits and then get psyched. It's an awesome race. So this is another My Plate for Athletes on your race day, and it actually shows that half the plate is grains. So again, complex carbs are that high test fuel. And every one of us in this room is unique, so you've gotta figure out what works for you during your training. Over the summer, experiment with your hydration. Make sure you have enough water every day. Look at your carbohydrate intake and make sure you know what fuels your body the best. And then the last thing, what was the first thing I wanted you to remember? The first saying? Ah, your body is a magnificent machine. The second thing I want you to remember is you are what you eat. So really important to do that. So some resources, and I'm sure we'll post this and make it available for you. American College of Sports Medicine. I often use the CDC for um, BMI calculations. They have an awesome BMI calculator. Choose My Plate, Dietary Guidelines for Americans, NIH, National Institutes of Health. The Olympic Committee Sports Dietitians has a lot of handouts for athletes. And University of Colorado also has some great um, handouts that they've developed. So, have an awesome race on August 4th. I'll be at the starting line with you, hopefully ahead of you. <laughs> so, um, practice during the summer, and I know we'll all be here to help, help guide you along and support you. So, I'm gonna turn it over to President Herbert. Thank you, Amber. Thank you so much. That was, that was awesome. So great advice, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. I was, of course, you can't help but as she's going through doing a mental comparison with what you, um, you, know, what you eat. And uh, the one thing I would say is if you have a highly competitive 18-year-old uh, in your house, um, you know, does all of that count? He eats, I've never seen so much crap he puts in his body <laughs> and he still runs like the wind, so um, go figure. But, 
Yeah, I was going to say, I keep telling him, just wait, it'll catch up to you. So anyway, um, no, that was really awesome. So thank you very much. And uh, it's my great pleasure. We have a very special guest today. So Joan Benoit Samuelson is with us. Um, she needs no introduction. Everyone, I'm sure, knows who she is. She is an icon in Maine. And it is such a pleasure to meet you. Thank you so much for coming. And so um, I would just like to say how much I appreciate what she has put together. I mean, not only is she iconic, I mean, she is the first woman to win the marathon in 1983, 80, 84, in Los Angeles at the Olympics, the first time that women were allowed to run the marathon because, believe it or not, before that, people thought that bad things would happen if women ran, like, go figure. And so she um, won that race, and is since she's this iconic figure in the state of Maine, well, beyond, but certainly in Maine, from Cape Elizabeth, she founded the Beach to Beacon, and is just this amazing person. And I've heard so many stories. First time I've met you, but I heard another um, St. Joni story, as they call them, <laughs> just this morning, as a matter of fact. And this one was that a close friend, and our new provost, actually, um, his wife and brother-in-law were um, cross-country skiing in the winter at Sugarloaf and said they went out at night and uh, around sunset and you know did quite the long run and they were on their way back and they were feeling kind of tired and you know kind of cranking along as best they could and all of a sudden something just flew by them just like uh, and um, and they recognized that it was it was Joan Benoit Samuelson so anyway um, uh, I, I have to tell you, I'm, uh, when I first arrived, I've been in Maine for a whole year now, minus two days. So, no, minus one day. So, tomorrow will be my one-year anniversary of being a Maina. And one of the first things I did when I got to Maine was signed up for the Beach to Beacon. It's not an easy bib to get, but I somehow managed. And I had so much fun running it. And I very much look forward, hopefully, to running it again this year. At the moment, I have a hamstring injury, so I've not been able to run. And, but I, we have two crack physical therapists in the back there, and they've been told that if they don't fix my, get my hamstring all well by race day, then they might be out of a job. So, you know, it's a little pressure there, Mike and Dennis, but um, I, uh, I'm, I'm hoping to be with you. Otherwise, I'm sorry I've missed the training runs so far because I, I did go out this weekend and try, and I made it a mile and a half before the pain got so intense that I had to stop. So I've been told it's better to stop before the pain gets really intense. Is that, <laughs> is that true? But anyway, so um, really look forward to seeing. And but I will be there. When, even if I can't run, I will definitely be there. And really looking forward to it. And thank you so much for coming today. So honored. Please. <laughs> Thank you very much, President Herbert, and thank you, Anne Marie. You know, people say it's hard to say no to me, but it's very <laughs> difficult to say no to Anne Marie. But we go way back, and um, uh, thank you for leading me this way. And uh, thank you, President Herbert and the University of New England for becoming a sponsor of the TD Beach to Beacon 10K. Um, it's very fitting, and. Um, President Herbert probably has quickly found that Maine is a very incestuous community, and everybody's connected somehow. And uh, one of our legacy sponsors and uh, one of our most generous sponsors is Northeast Delta Dental, and I know they've done great things on this campus. So um, I just came from another meeting with a potential new sponsor, and that was very um, exciting. So... Um, you know, I don't know where to start. I'm not as organized as Anna Marie and don't have a PowerPoint. I do everything on the run and by the seat of my pants. And I thought initially I was coming to the Portland campus and not to the Bitterford campus. So I had an 11 o'clock meeting and then I found out it was down here in Bitterford and I said, what am I to do? And uh, I cut the meeting short and I would have been here at 12.15 but the traffic in Saco was a bit difficult to contend with. Um, but I'm here and, and happy to be here, and what a beautiful campus you have. And uh, we could have a beach to beacon right here, or a bay to, bay to uh, something. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, I, uh, I have very few idle moments, and even with the longest days of the year upon us, um, I still can't find enough hours in the day. That's why I'm out at night with a light cross-country skiing, and I was out in my gardens last night uh, 
by the moonlight um, after the rain had stopped, which we desperately needed. So um, the Beach to Beacon was founded uh, 21 years ago. We're now legal. Um, and, uh, you know, the way my mind works, I love finding niches within the race for our sponsors. Everybody has a story to tell, and I think storytelling is almost a lost art, and it's very important to keep that uh, storytelling going, um, even with all the social media. And I was just informed by Amy that you're live streaming me, and what I can't see won't hurt me. I don't do Facebook because I don't even have enough time for my texts and emails, and I just sat down for a second out there and said, found an email or a text that said, can you be in L.A. on the 21st? Well, what's today? The ninth? I mean, that's the way I work. But uh, I'll rest when I'm dead, and I hope I have a few more years before that happens. <laughs> So um, I had this idea, uh, you know, we have some of the most beautiful campuses in the state of Maine and we have some of the most beautiful roads and we have some of the best people and, and generous businesses and corporations and organizations. So I was out running one day and I thought, wouldn't it be great to bring a world-class road race to the state of Maine? And I grew up in Cape Elizabeth, and I think the Department of Public Works was happy when I moved to Freeport because uh, they didn't have to uh, continually uh, amend and fix the roads with my, my footprint uh, going miles and miles throughout the community. And uh, I've run races all over the world, and I ran a race in San Francisco called the uh, Beta Breakers Race. I don't know if any of you have ever run that race, but it's... Um, it's more of a festival than anything else. And uh, I thought, well, why don't we do an East Coast uh, counterpart to the Beta Breakers? And I came up with Beach to Beacon, starting at Crescent Beach. And how many of you have run the race? Oh, wow. Good. Are there any legacy runners here? Um, we changed the name from Streaker to Legacy. Um, we thought it was more complimentary. Uh, and uh, I thought, now where could we run this race and take in many of the scenic views? And I thought, well, the beach could be Crescent Beach State Park. And of course, the beacon is Portland Headlight, which, as many of you must know, was the first lighthouse commissioned by General George Washington, President George Washington. And that became the course. And I went out and ran it one day. And I said, yes, I think this is probably around 10K. And if not, we'll make it 10K. And it was almost right on the money, 10K. So I thought, hmm, how are we going to make this happen? And um, I sat on a board at the time, the Gulf of Maine Aquarium Board. We finally do have an aquarium, which is great. But this was way back. And uh, one of the board members was, and I don't think I'm telling uh, tales out of school or college, but uh, was Jim Moore, who was the former president of Unum. And Jim... Uh, was unable to make many meetings, but this time he showed up and he excused himself early, and I excused myself right on his coattails. And back then, the corporate logo was a lighthouse beacon for Union Mutual. And I thought, well, that'd be a great title sponsor. And I chased him out of the room, and I said, Jim, may I have a minute and a half of your time before you move on? And he said, well, what's on your mind? Well, Jim was an all-American runner at uh, Villanova, I believe. He held the record on the 4x4 relay. And I said, I have this idea for a road race. And he paused for a minute, and he said, that's a great idea, but it's not on our radar screen. So I said, OK. And then a year or so later, I was invited by uh, the then president of People's Heritage Bank, Bill Ryan, to, to meet with him to talk about becoming a spokesperson for the bank. And so I said, I'd be happy to come and meet with you, and walked into his office. And we had a nice exchange, or many exchanges and, and great conversations and thanked him for the opportunity and um, was leaving his op office and noticed a small picture in the corner on a small table of of Bill finishing the New York City Marathon. I had no idea he was a runner. I said, are you a runner? He said, well, I've run five New York City Marathons. I said, you're kidding. And I said, boy, do I have an idea for you. And he said, there's no time like the present. What's your idea? And I said, well, I'd like to bring a race to, a world-class race to Maine. And I'd like to call it um, the Beach to Beacon. And what's great about our sport is that it's all-inclusive. And you can't go to Center Court in Wimbledon, or you can't go to Augusta National and, and play golf with the best uh, athletes in those sports. But you can run with the best runners in our sport. And he said, we'll do it. I mean, he didn't even blink. 
And I said, really? And so that really was the impetus and the um, genesis for the for the, the starting of the People's uh, Beach to Beacon 10K, which then became the uh, Bank North 10K, and then the TD Bank North 10K, and then, <laughs> so it's undergone many um, different uh, titles, but uh, it's 21 now, and uh, we're legal, and um, we, uh, We've grown in size. Unfortunately, we, you know, I said it's all inclusive, and unfortunately, we have to turn many runners away because it's so popular. Uh, but we, we just keep running with it. We we don't become complacent. We bring in a couple of new sponsors every year. We tweak it a little bit. Um, we started the kids race a few years after the 10K started, and now this will be our third year for the high school mile, and we have seven of the eight mile championships in the state committed to run on Friday evening before the race. And we uh, brought on the re best race director in the world, Dave McGilvery, um, who's the race director for the Boston Marathon and several other races as our, as our race director. Um, and we've attracted some of the best runners in the world. Uh, but running is a very affordable and um, accessible sport. And I think the fact that we benefit a different char children's charity every year is important. But to me, the biggest win, and speaking to a group in the allied sciences, health sciences, um, is my biggest uh, joy is pulling spectators off the sideline and having them become participants. Um, and by the way, can I be second in line behind you with the PTs? You're in good company with Bill Rogers. I was with Bill Rogers this weekend on Shelter Island, and um, he couldn't run because of a hamstring. And I shouldn't have run because of an Achilles, but you know, no brain, no pain. And uh, I just sucked it up and, and cut off the back of my shoe and, and ran. Um, <laughs> but. <laughs> Anyway, um, I love our sport. I love the people who are on our board and on our organizing committee. Um, we really care. It's really a family of, of, of passionate people. And when I speak to younger people, I talk about how important it is to um, possess four, four attributes that all begin with P. And at the top of my list is passion. And then there's patience, because we all have to be patient with injuries. Some of us, not so much. And then persistence and perseverance. And I was at an elementary school in Albany, New York, a few weeks ago. And I'll tell you what, these kids nailed the four Ps right out of the blocks. It was like, whoa. And this is like first grade to fifth grade. And they knew all those big multisyllabic words. So, um, you know, we're two months away, less than two months away. And um, things are getting very exciting. We have some new... Um, tricks up our sleeve for this year's race and uh, what else can I say except thank you all for your sponsorship and for your participation in the sport and I see you're sporting last year's t-shirt that's another story that's my second favorite t-shirt to date um, but you know it's transcendent the sport of running we've reached out into the community and that design was done by a student at Mecca and uh, uh, there'll be another Mecca design on the t-shirts this year. I can't show you the design because it'll be a surprise. But it's um, it's just a lot of fun to be involved with. And uh, we'll see how long we run. <laughs> and if there's time, I guess I'd be happy to answer any questions. or. So as an upcoming second year medical student, I don't have a lot of free time during the year for training or staying in shape or sleeping. Um, so I'm wondering what suggestions you have for just kind of staying in fit throughout the year or even just kind of living an active lifestyle. Well, I think everything I do is active. Um, I think cross training is important, especially as I age. I find it more and more important. So in the winter, I do a lot of Nordic skiing, and I can actually get my heart rate up higher on s and faster on skis than I can on my own two feet because I'm not as efficient at skiing as I am at running, so I have to work harder. Um, I'm now doing a lot of cycling. Um, <laughs> And I love to be out of the saddle more than in the saddle, but because that simulates uh, 
some lights running more than um, sitting in the saddle. Uh, I do some paddling. Um, I think the skiing is very important because it builds my upper body, and I think my legs are much stronger than my arms, and I think if my arms can become stronger to match the strength of my legs, then I'm going to run more efficiently, and I'll be more balanced as far as effort's concerned. So um, cross-training, always taking the stairs, parking in the outer perimeters of, of parking lots, um, you know, just moving all the time. I mean, we have a window seat in our house that people see as soon as they come into the house, and they said, oh, you must spend hours in there taking naps and reading. And I said, I can count the hand on the fingers on my hands and tell you how many times I've sat on one hand in that seat. So um, I just go. I mean, that's who I am, and um, sometimes I think I don't get enough sleep, and I don't eat as well as Anne-Marie suggests. <laughs> but, you know, to me, the, the key is balance. The key is balance in diet. The key in, is balance in, in work life, um, ratios and balances. Um, you know, I just try to live as balanced a life as I possibly can, and sometimes I really have to work on that. But. Hi, thanks for the wonderful presentation. I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about whether you endorse and, and to what extent weight training for runners. If you're a half marathon or marathon runner, should you be doing leg presses and regularly hitting the gym as a way to b build up your legs and, and the rest of your body, or is that something that isn't um, entirely necessary? I um, don't do any weight training specifically. We have a wood-burning stove, so I lug a lot of wood. I'm a master gardener, so I do a lot of gardening. I use my upper body a lot. Um, and I lift bags that are probably heavier than I should be lifting when I travel, and I've finally gone to a roller um, because that was really knocking me off balance. And I don't do weights, per se. Um, I had a knee issue. Um, this past fall that kept me out of the New York City, uh, the Chicago Marathon. And I think athletes, and I don't know how many PTs or doctors are in this room, but I think athletes know their bodies more than their coaches or their personal trainers or sometimes <laughs> the medical community because I had something catching in my medial joint on my left knee and it would just catch in mid-stride and mid-air. And I kept telling all these people I would see. It's so reminiscent of what was happening to me in 1984 before the trials when I had a plica, and Anne Marie remembers this, in my right knee, which was doing the exact same thing. And I said, you know, it's not osteoarthritis. Yes, I know I must have some arthritis after 150,000 miles of running, but it's not strictly osteoarthritis. And so finally, a doctor in Kentucky who wound up doing the procedure said, you have a plica. Well, plica is embryonic tissue that never fully develops, and it was locking the joint, and that's exactly what was happening in my right knee. And if it's a congenital issue, then maybe if I had one in my right knee, I'd have one in my left knee. So unfortunately, it had abraded a lot of the cartilage, but that's feeling a lot better now if I can just get over the Achilles injury. You know, isn't it something like the ankle bones connected to the knee bones? <laughs> so anyway. So I'm saying to PTs and docs, listen to your patients, especially if they're athletes and especially if they're runners because they will do anything to get out the door. Am I right? <laughs> Do you have any tips on how to psychologically prepare yourself for a long run that you know is going to be difficult? Uh, I would find a friend who runs to share some of the miles with you. It might not have to be for the entire run, but part of the run. And also I tell people who are training for marathons for the first time or maybe even the 17th time, break the distance up so that t the 26-mile point two distance doesn't seem so daunting and intimidating. So I usually try to say, okay, I'm going out for a 10K, and then I have um, 20 miles left, 
I do a lot of 20 mile training runs and that, then I say, okay, you've really got to focus and, and work the next 10 miles like you're running a race um, and then see what you have left for the last 10. But um, breaking the distance down, even in training, that helps mentally. Uh, and I think marathon, I c said to my coach right before the Olympics in 84, I said, whoever wants this race the most is going to win. And I wasn't the favorite there. And it's easier going into an event as an underdog. But the couple days before the actual marathon, I saw a woman running down San Vicente Boulevard in the opposite direction. She was surrounded by an entourage of, of people. And I got back to where I was staying, and I said uh, to the, my coach, I don't know who I saw out there, but if she's running the mar marathon, I guarantee you she's going to win a medal. Well, there was already Regina Joyce and Greta Weitz and Ingrid Christensen and Anne Marie Davy, and I'm like, um, Jeez, I went, and it turned out it was Rosa Moda from Portugal who won the bronze medal that year and then went on to win the gold in Seoul. So sometimes you can tell a book by its cover. Um. I was just wondering if you would share um, some of your favorite pre-race meals or snacks. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, my pre-race meals, um, I eat a lot of fish and a lot of, poultry, I eat red meat when I crave it, um, and I like pasta, whether it's a marathon or a 10K. I eat a lot of, of fruit and vegetables and, and grains and, and, and rice. Um, I do have a chocolate chip cookie that's a staple in my diet that's made with a lot of oatmeal, and uh, Nancy Clark, who's a well-known nutritionist, gave it a A rating. Um, so if somebody comes into our house and there isn't a bunch of cookies in the cookie jar, then something's wrong. I mean, um, so uh, that's my go-to. And, you know, I'm not great. I usually in the morning will have a cup of coffee at my computer for a half hour or so, and then I'll try to do some strengthening and stretching exercises, and then I'll run out the door, and then I'll... <laughs> grab another half a cup of coffee and a couple of chocolate chip cookies and a banana, and then I'm off until I run out of gas, and then I'll stop and pick up a sandwich wherever I am. And then I eat, I know this is wrong, <laughs> but I eat a pretty big dinner. And last night I ate at quarter of 10. Um, so don't listen to Anne-Marie, don't listen to me. <laughs> But again, I try to balance it. I try, and I do have a garden at home, and I fe feed the whole neighborhood and the local pantry um, with excess. And um, that's great exercise, and I know exactly what I'm eating, and I try to eat free range and local whenever possible. Let me add my thanks for being here today. Thank well. you. Hope to see you on the 4th before the August run. Yeah. Well, I, I'm hoping my body will allow me to run. That's my longest uninterrupted streak of runs. This will be my 33rd consecutive L.L. Bean 10K. So. So, so since we're on the injury theme, I'm, I'm just kind of curious, um, during either or any of your Achilles or, or um, hamstring injuries, have you ever, uh, I'm asking this for somebody else in the room to hear your answer, if, if, you, if you've actually used water-based running uh, as an alternative while you're trying to heal and what your thoughts are on that? Yes, I think I, I, think I should be doing a lot more of it. Um, <laughs> I've been in the pool a few times right after the scope. I'll tell you, I get so cold <laughs> in the swimming. I get colder in pools than I do in the ocean, and the ocean is almost warm enough for me to get into. We live on tidal frontage, so I try to uh, schedule my runs around the tides as best I can. Um, but for me to get in my car, to get to the pool, to get into my bathing suit, to do the workout, to get out of the pool, out of the shower, which I stay in for a long time to warm up, and then get, it's just a lot of time, which I don't have a lot of time. <laughs> and, you know, right now I'm doing a lot of bike riding, but it takes me two or three times as long to get in a comparable workout on the bike than it does running. And I don't feel like I'm getting a workout as in the pool as much as I do um, on the bike or on my own two feet running. But I always have this huge appetite when I get out of the pool. So I don't know what that's all about. But um, 
Um, water, I think water-based training, swimming, running in the pool, I think that's probably what I should be doing and strictly doing that for about a month to clear everything up, but you pick your poison, right? <laughs> Hi, uh, I am uh, not a competitive racer, but I race to beat myself. Uh, I am about to start training for my first ever marathon. I've done a few halves, but I'm looking to go the next step. Uh, and to put it plainly, I'm, I'm scared. <laughs> uh, so what is your biggest tip for someone who is setting out to complete this goal the first time? Well, if you've run a couple of half marathons, I think you'll be fine. Um, some people think they need to run 26.2 miles in training to get the confidence that they need to run a marathon. I don't suggest that you run more than 20 miles in training. Um, and it takes me about as long to run 20 miles as it does to race 26.2 miles. So you're not leaving your, your race on the, on the road, so to speak. Um, but it's important to to pace yourself, to stay hydrated, so maybe you'll plan, especially in the summer months, water bottles along your route or have somebody meet you. Um, and I would just remember in the actual marathon, mentally it's a lot easier to pass people at the end, and that goes for the Beach to Beacon as well, 10K, any distance. It's a lot easier to pass people at the end than it is to be passed. And it's very humbling to be passed by runners toward the later stages of the, the race. So um, again, pace yourself accordingly. And um, you know, it's, it, the marathon can be a humbling experience. And no matter what kind of an experience you have out there, you'll probably say, um, I'm finished, one and done. But then you'll try to sleep that night, and you probably won't because you'll be playing the race over and over in your head, and you'll say, well, next time, maybe if I did this and didn't do that, I'd run a little bit faster. So um, it's a journey, and everybody approaches it differently, and everybody has different outcomes. And um, Trust your body, trust your training, and don't second-guess what you've done to prepare. I guess that's the best advice I can give you. Um, <clears throat> whether it's time or injuries, all athletes kind of hit that point where they know that they're never going to be able to do what they were beforehand, um, which for competitive people can be rather daunting and frustrating. Um, how has your approach to being competitive changed over your career? And what advice would you give to people when they're looking long term at, at being competitive, not necessarily at the Olympic level or professional level, but for personal competition? Um, how would you approach that psychological point as advice for other people? Well, I guess, again, I'll have to go back to that P word, passion. I just love to run. I truly love to run. And today, I should have been on the bicycle and not on my own two feet, but I didn't have time to do a workout that I thought would give me my fix for the day on the bike, so I went out for a shorter run. And... Um, I was going to run my, l so it's through storytelling as well as passion that I motivate myself today. And I know I'll never, never run as fast as I once did. I mean, the goal of running a sub 220 eluded me. Had I looked at the marathon course in Chicago in 1985 before I ran the course, I might have been able to achieve the time there. But the important thing there was to beat Ingrid Christensen, who was the world record holder at the time. And so all of a sudden there was a finish line and I had a lot left because Rosa Moto was also in the field and I, 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 I was on that day and I just wanted to make sure that if they caught me, I'd be able to run with them. And then I ran out of real estate and there was a finish line and I felt like I could have kept going. But um, so in 2008, the Olympic trials came to Boston and I was 50 at the time and I thought, why not end my career in Boston in an Olympic trial at the age of 50 where I ran my first marathon? And that told the story, so that motivated me. Not only was I turning, had, not only had I turned 50, but I also wanted to run a sub 250 marathon. So that was the goal. And then that was gonna be the end of my competitive marathoning. So, long story short, 
I get to the finish line in 249 something, and I had a bad calf injury, and I ran in training shoes in that trial. And the three Olympic qualifiers, including Dina Castor, who's the current American record holder, were there to greet me, and we sort of walked off into the sunset, and I was very grateful that they had waited for me to finish. And that was it, so I thought. And then the following year, I got a call from Mary Wittenberg, who was the president of the New York Roadrunners, and she said, how would you like to come to New York to celebrate the 25th anniversary of your Olympic win and the 40th anniversary of the New York City Marathon? I said, well, that tells a story. I'll come. <laughs> and then the press, the press called, but they said, we thought you'd retired. What are you doing coming to New York? I said, well, the story was there, and I want to come. And then the next year, it was a Chicago marathon, and it was, the date was 10-10-10. And who can pass up on <laughs> a number spread like that? So, and it was the 25th anniversary of my fastest time in Chicago. So that told the story. And a, two weeks later, it was the Athens Marathon, which was the 25th, 100th anniversary of the Battle of Marathon. Of the Battle of Marathon, and I said, "Well, that tells a story." And any ma any person with a marathon resume should be there. But in between the Chicago Marathon and the Athens Marathon, two weeks apart, I had f I'd flown back to Boston the night of the Chicago Marathon to run the Tufts 10K, Tufts Health Plan 10K, the next morning. And then two days later, I flew out to San Francisco to run the Nike woman's half. And then I flew from there to Athens. So I'm a little off center sometimes. <laughs> but I mean, that was stupid. That was <laughs> absolutely. But it's all about storytelling. So then in 2014, um, I ran the, the Boston Marathon. And the goal was to run faster. Within 30 minutes of the time, I ran 30 years early, or which was my fastest time in, in New York. And I had um, the goal of running a sub 252 because my time had been 222. And I had just been over in China with Nike because a lot of people have asked me about labor practices in China as a Nike athlete. And I just told them what I'd heard. And then I finally asked, hey, can I? go over there, or they suggested that I go over there. So I did, I went over to Guangzhou, and I'll tell you, the factory conditions over there were f much nicer than some of the factory conditions in our own state, and I, I mean that sincerely. The nutritional piece was unbelievable, what they ate, and the cafeteria had all the lines on the floor for badminton and basketball, I mean, so, and they just moved the tables aside on weekends and nights, so the athletes who lived next door in a dormitory, there were wash basins around the perimeter of the whole cafeteria. It was just immaculate and very impressive. So um, I, uh, I, I did that, and um, while I was over there, I saw the shoemaking and the fly knit and, you know, how they make sustainable shoes, because that's a very big interest area of mine. And I don't know if you know the name Shalane Flanagan and uh, Kara Goucher. Uh, Shalane's still a Nike athlete, Kara's moved on. But their shoes were in the final stages of, of being sent to them. And they had personalized sock liners. And I jokingly said, well, where's my shoes? <laughs> Where are my shoes? And uh, they said, are you running Boston? And I said, I am. And they said, well, what do you want your shoes to say? And I said, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I said, I'm not in their league anymore. I'm just giving you a hard time. And they said, no, no, we really want to do a shoe for you. So in one insole, it said T-I-N-F-L, for there is no finish line. And that was a campaign Nike did with me 28 years ago because that's how old our son was. And wherever I went, he went because I was his mother and nursing him. And uh, the other shoe said 2.52.43, which was a time I was trying to beat. And they came to me about a week before Boston. And I crossed the line in 2.50 point something. And I took the shoes off to show my husband and uh, family and walked back to the hotel through the medical tent. It was a beautiful day like today. The head of medical, Chris Trionis, was in there. I gave him a high five. I said, you so deserve this day. Showered, got cleaned up, getting ready to go to lunch, and then all hell broke loose. And 
my husband knew immediately that they were bombs and I, and the building the hotel shook a bit and I said just relax they're just transformers because there were trucks from all over the world with satellite dishes you know beaming the broadcast and he said no and he said we're going to the basement stat and so yeah that was a horrible horrible year um, so I felt committed to go back I really didn't think I thought that was going to be it with the storytelling and so the next year we went back as a family, um, our daughter, our son, and the goal was to run, just to run, to just be part of it, really. But then I said, well, why don't we try to run within 30 minutes of each other, 30 years after the Olympics? <laughs> and, and we did. We did. And uh, so our son w ran a 250.01. I ran a 250. 52 that year and our daughter ran a 314 but I thought I was the first one in because our son came up on my back and I said oh thank goodness I didn't know you were right on my heels otherwise I probably would have dissolved and <laughs> Dave McGilvery the race director had pulled him into the wings when he crossed even with all the tightened, secu heightened security and Dave said sorry but he beat you to the line he ran 250.01 well, the difference between our son and me is that that time would have driven me crazy. I would have wanted to go out and run a sub 250, but nope, mom, I'm one and done. <laughs> so that's the difference. Uh, but it's the storytelling that really keeps me motivated. So I have one last story to tell, uh, hopefully, and it may elude me like the sub 220 did, and that is to run a sub three hour marathon at the age of 60, now 61. But our daughter is now 30, and she was hoping to run under three in Boston, which she didn't because of the horrible day. Were any of you in Boston running this year? It was awful. I was there. It, you were volunteering? That was probably far worse than running. Thank you. But, um, but she what didn't make that goal, and I know she's capable of doing it. So I'm thinking, well, maybe we can try again in Chicago, you know, sub three at 30 and 60, 360, mother, daughter. You know, it's the whole numbers story game that I keep playing, and that's what keeps me going. So one last question. Actually, I'm going to forego my question because th that was too good. I want to end on that. <laughs> th those stories, my question will be boring by comparison, although I'm happy to know that um, I can tell my physical therapist that I should just ignore my injuries and just keep running, <laughs> right? That's, that was the take-home message I got, so. Um, no. And then... <laughs> <laughs> so, no, but in all seriousness, I can't thank you enough, not only for coming today, but for setting up and sponsoring the Beach to Beacon, which is such a, a wonderful, iconic event in Maine. I mean, I have to say that me arriving as new president, it was one of the things that I t I've talked about the most this year as one of the highlights of my first year here, and it sort of welcomed me to the state. It was a wonderful, just a, uh, I've run a, a number of races, but it, it was my favorite of any that I've run, and I really look forward to doing it again this, this year, if I can, at least being there. And I want to thank the UNE community. I mean, people, there was already a big contingent of folks who have been running the B2B, you know, over the years, but now a lot more have come out, and it's become kind of a thing, and it's really great to be part of that. The other thing is, in addition to the runners, is that our health sciences students, and this is our medical students, but also our physical therapy students in particular, have for years been manning the medical tents, or personing, I think is the correct verb now, but have been working at the, the medical tents. And it was great last year after the race, I, I got to talk to them and, and hear about the work that they did and how many people, back to your point about hydration, by far the most common injury were dehydration and people spike a fever. And so it's wonderful that, that we're able to partner with the race in that way and have so many of our students helping out. So as a small token, just a very small oh, token of your you. coming out, this is your UNE Nor'easter uh, shirt oh, here. Oh, thank you it's, very um, much. It's not a running shirt, so well, you know great. you don't want to well. get you further dehydrated, but for <laughs> after running. Um, so again, thank you so much for coming, and I look forward to seeing you on race day. Well, thank you all very much, and thank you, President Herbert, because um, we, we are so um, delighted with the partnership and so appreciative 
but I also want to thank you for all that you do for the Maine community oh, and Maine you. students, who um, many of whom stay here where they belong, um, <laughs> and uh, in the allied health professions as well as in the marine studies. Um, I've got another idea. I'm always I'm the idea person. I'm the visionary. I'm not the implementer. I'm not organized enough to be the the uh, implementer, but. Um, you know, I'm, I'm working on another project and I'll be on another college campus on the summer solstice to keep working this idea and uh, stay well, tuned. Keep, keep us in mind because we love to <laughs> No, you're definitely in mind okay, because okay. you're part of the network. <laughs> Sounds but, good to uh, me. All right, but uh, thank you all and have a great summer. And uh, I love to see these days of, of summer come. But I hate to see the summer solstice actually arrive because that means the days are getting shorter. And as I said earlier, there are never enough hours in the day, even in the longest days of the year. So um, thank you all for coming. Thanks, everybody.